But I want for us, just for a moment, if you will with me, uh, I want to just look to the text and for us to see together not what one person says, because as Tony rightly said this morning, this has nothing to do with what man says or man thinks, but what God says. And so we're going to let the Word of God direct us as to the power, the saving power of the gospel. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Brethren, it is imperative that we believe this. The gospel is the power for salvation. And not just believe it, but that we live like we believe it, which means we are a people who trust in the Word of God. We are people who obey the Word of God, and we are people who share this life, soul-saving message. The gospel was the power of salvation when it was first preached, and the gospel has not lost its power today. Souls are saved. Destinies are changed because of the gospel today. And your Bible's 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the Apostle Paul summarizes the gospel, the heart of the gospel message. He, he summarizes it plain, plain and clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1. When he says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. What is the heart of the gospel message? Jesus. Jesus the Christ, the, the Messiah, the Savior came. Jesus died for our sins, but if you and I are reading that in verse two, 3, it says Jesus died for my sins. Everything that I have done... Every crime, every wrong, every sin that I've committed, he died for my sins, but he was raised on the third day. The scripture verified it. History confirms it. The Savior lived it. The gospel, the heart of the gospel is a God who loves us too much to let us go. So he gave his son to die in our place. In your Bibles, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Our children have been studying this this week. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we find the reason. We find the emotion. We find the purpose for the sending of Jesus to, to earth. And this is a message that's true for everyone here today. There's not a person present. There's not a person across the world that these verses don't apply to. And so if you're here today and you don't believe me, listen to these words and let them sink into your heart because this is talking to you. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator, mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. God desires all to be saved. Every single one of us. There is not a person so deep in sin, so far from God. There is not something you have done that is so grave, so evil, so wrong, repeated so many times that your God does not love you, does not want you, has not given his son for you. It feels that way sometimes. In fact, in your Bibles, if you go but a few books before, in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, the message of God's love the purpose of the gospel message and the pain that we wrestle with of our worthiness to it is expressed in one of the most clear and beautiful ways in Ephesians chapter 2. Because maybe this is describing you today in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. When he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And I don't know about you, but if I'm looking at Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, and I'm looking at the lens of my life, it might read a little different from yours, because I see my life, and I see Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, and I see the things I've done. I see the thoughts that I have dwelled on. I see the lust and the anger and the hate and the pain. I see the ways that I have hurt others and I see the way that I have hurt God. I see the way that I have taken the beautiful life that God gave me and I ruined it. 
and I soiled it, and I threw it away. And that's our place where we think, how, how in the world, as we sang that God who is, who is so great, how in the world could he see anything good, anything redemptive, anything worth saving in someone like me? Verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Uh, not as a result of works that no man may boast, but we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. He didn't abandon us to his fate. He didn't turn his back on us, even though we turn our back on him. God, rich in mercy, with his deep, unmeasurable love, gave Jesus by grace you are saved. The immeasurable, unfathomable, undescribable gift of mercy and love and compassion. Now verse 8 makes it clear. God offers something you can't refuse. A second chance, forgiveness, everything, the slate wiped clean. God offers you the opportunity to be adopted into his family, to be part of his people. And it says in verse 8, those who receive this incredible gift are those who who believe. You were saved by grace through faith. In our Bibles, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, the writer makes it clear that if we are going to come to God, if I want more than anything to have a relationship with this God and to walk with him and be near him, Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 6, it reads, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Those who want to come near to God, you have to believe there is a God. I believe in God. I believe because of the evidence in the world. I believe because of the trustworthy, verifiable evidence of the word of God that this God is real. And I believe that what he says is true. I trust in him. He's faithful. And so if he says he'll forgive my sins, I trust him and I believe him on that. If he says that if I turn my life and give it to him, that he will adopt me into his family, I believe him on that. If he says what's promised to those who live in him is eternal life in heaven, I believe him on that. If you want to come to God, you have to believe. Believe not just that there is a God, but I believe everything that he says. Enough so that I'm willing to completely commit my life to it. And so of that Savior, that God, in Mark chapter 1 in your Bibles, in Mark chapter 1... If that Savior, if that God that I am striving to know and to walk with, if he says something like this, Mark 1, verse 14. Mark 1, 14. After John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Listen, repent and believe in the gospel. I believe in God. I believe everything he says enough to where I'm going to put it into action in my life. And this God, this Savior God says, repent and believe, which means the things that caused me to be far from God, the things that ruined my relationship with God, the crimes I committed, the habits I built, the friends I enveloped, the life I was living. He says, if I want to be saved, if I want to come to him, I have to leave those things behind. I need to break some habits. I need to change some choices. I need to make the life I used to live as if it were dead, no longer living. But I'm willing because I believe. I believe in him. I believe in what he says. And if he says, leave it behind, whatever it is he used to do, I'm leaving it behind. I'm making a change. I realize it was wrong. I realize it was corruptive. I realize how deadly it was. And I'm willing today to change my life, to change my habits, to change my direction, and to be all in with him. In your Bibles, let's go to Romans chapter, nine, Romans chapter 10. Romans 
Romans chapter 10, and in verse 9, Apostle Paul writes, If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. I was talking with Eli yesterday. If you love a woman and you really love her, why would you not tell that woman? Because once you say it, you can't take it back. Can't go back the next week and say, I didn't really mean it. If you say it, you're committing to something. You're expressing something that is real and true deep down within the heart. And to express something that is real and true and genuine deep down is to set one person on a path of commitment. I love you. I am pursuing you. I want you to know my heart's desire and my intent. Paul says belief is in the heart, but it is made known through a life that confesses. Yes, with our tongues, I believe in Jesus, and I'm not ashamed to say it. But even more in the way that we live, I believe in God. I do. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus, and I'm not ashamed to confess through my life. He is Lord. He is my Lord and my Savior, and I believe enough to live that, to do that. Even if that means in Mark chapter 16, in your Bibles, Mark chapter 16, Mark 16, and in verse 16, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. I believe, and I believe in this God enough to where if he says, be baptized, put me on, be buried in waters, I was buried in death, I will, I will. He who comes to me must believe. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So he who comes to me must believe that he is. And that he is willing to do what he says. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But what if I stumble along the way? What if I do all that this is what, what Jesus says? What if I, as summed up in Acts 2, when the Jews at Pentecost said, what must we do to be saved? I'm ready. What must I do to obey this Lord? And Peter said to them in Acts 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And so if I do all of that and I do what Jesus says, but what if I just can't commit? Because what if I stumble all along the way? What if I go back to the old habits and back to the old ways and back to the old words and back to the old friends? In 1 John chapter 1 in your Bibles, in 1 John chapter 1, and maybe this is a great reminder for those who have made the commitment a long time ago. In 1 John chapter 1. Verse 5, John says, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. And the truth of God is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Do you see the idea here? There is fellowship. There is a relationship between God and his people because, in verse 6, the saving blood of Jesus Christ. But listen, to say I'm with God. I'm in a right relationship with God. I have fellowship with God. I'm a saved person. While we walk in darkness, you're fooling yourself. You're kidding yourself. God is light and there's no darkness in him at all. And so if I want to live in darkness and pursue the darkness, I'm doing it on my own without God. But for those who are with God and stumble along the way, one of the questions Eli asked last, last afternoon was, but what if I do? What if I commit to something that I can't keep and I stumble and I fall along the way? And John says we do. Because in verse 8 and in verse 10, if we as people who walk in the light say that we have no sin, we lie. And we deceive ourselves and others. 
We're not going to do it perfect. But the choice is mine as to whether I do it alone or not. And God invites us to come. Because what orphan standing alone with a family who is willing to adopt and welcome them says, I'm just too afraid to accept that adoption because I'm afraid I'm going to let them down. And you will. But the choice is yours. Do you want to make mistakes on your own, abandoned by yourself, or to make them with a family, with a Savior, with a place, with the offer of grace for forgiveness? Can you look at one more passage? One more passage in the end of 1 John, 1 John 5. First John 5 and verse 11. The testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. The question for every single one of us this morning, do you know today you have eternal life? Not hope, not question or wonder. Do you today sit confident today that you have eternal life, that you are saved, adopted into the family of God, that you are heaven bound? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of salvation to everyone who believes. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe he died for your sins, your sins? Do you believe he raised on the third day? Do you believe that if you turn from your sins, confess him as Lord and put him on in baptism today, today, Your sins would be forgiven. You adopted into his family and you would leave a child of God. If so, right now, right now, not a moment's hesitation. If you have not given your life to God, today is the day. This moment is yours. If you are ready today to put on Christ, don't wait. God's given you the time. He's given you the opportunity. And this morning, we're giving you the chance. Real life, real love, real forgiveness and grace can be yours And we would love to help you. If we can do it in any way, we're going to do it right now as we sing and as we sing. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can. But thank you for connecting with us.